So Romans chapter 8, we're going to look at verses 1 through 4 this morning. Uh, Romans 8, and uh, we're going to take a few weeks and, and look at this chapter. It's one of the uh, favorite chapters uh, of the book of Romans, and the uh, uh, first and last verses are uh, favorites among many believers. So verses, uh, chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, Paul writes, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. It's been said that if the Bible is a ring, then the book of Romans is its precious stone, and that chapter 8 is the sparkling point of the jewel. Uh, the first several chapters of uh, Romans take a, a somewhat dim view of man, and uh, describe man as, as being wicked and worthless, uh, and uh, describes exactly the condition of sinful man. Chapter 7 asks in exasperation, who will rescue me from this body of death? And of course we see the answer is, uh, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so now in chapter 8, we move on to the implications of our new relationship with God as Paul lays those things out. You know, have you ever noticed that there's a difference in a person who has trusted Jesus as their personal Savior? Uh, you, 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 you see that they act differently, they think differently, they speak differently, uh, they walk and talk differently. There's something uh, that uh, stands out about their lives. And, and uh, many times as believers, we can kind of uh, uh, find, uh, locate each other, and even as strangers. We, we, we uh, can see that there's something different. And of course, that's the Holy Spirit uh, uh, testifying within us. But... <clears throat> Uh, the reason that uh, believers act and talk uh, and think differently is because they've been invaded by a being from another place. Uh, at the very instant of salvation, the child of God is filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. And so when the Holy Spirit comes in, he does... Uh, he does a, a, a change, and it makes a change in our life, and then he comes to abide with the new believer forever. Jesus said in John 14, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. And so when the Spirit of God comes into a life, that life is forever changed. And that's the essence of, of our being made a new creature, as Paul uh, speaks of again in, in 2 Corinthians 5. Uh, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Uh, although old things are passed away, behold, new things have come. And so it is this life of the Spirit and in the Spirit that's the focus of chapter 8 of Romans. Paul starts off, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And, uh, you know, that's a verse that we, we ought to take some time to let it sink in. At one time, we were everything that Paul described in chapter 3. Uh, we were rebels whose only future was judgment and condemnation. However, now, because of Christ, there is no condemnation for us. Uh, as uh, members of the family of God, uh, that condemnation is gone. Uh, later on, uh, Paul is going to ask the question, who is he that condemns? Uh, of course, the answer is that Jesus Christ died for our sins, he was raised, and he intercedes now, so that there is no condemnation whatsoever. To be free in Christ is to be free of condemnation. And so Romans 8 is the Christian's declaration of freedom. Uh, and in this chapter, Paul declares four spiritual freedoms that we enjoy because of our union with Christ. And uh, so the, the emphasis being on the Holy Spirit, uh, we see him mentioned 19 times, and then uh, we see those spiritual freedoms. And so this morning, we want to look at some of these freedoms that we have. Uh, we are free from judgment. There is no condemnation for believers. So first of all, we are delivered from the sentence of sin. Uh, 
And verse 1, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We're delivered from the sentence of sin. We have that promise of no condemnation. Uh, if we contrast chapter 3 of Romans and chapter 8 of Romans, you can see that in chapter 3, uh, Paul shows the therefore of condemnation. He says, Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But in chapter 8, uh, we see the therefore of no condemnation. Uh, and uh, authorities in the Greek language tell us that the verse reads uh, as follows in the original, Therefore now there is not even one bit of condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And so it's a very emphatic uh, statement there. There's no condemnation from the law because Jesus fulfilled the law. Uh, there's no condemnation from our sin, uh, uh, which we inherited through Adam, uh, because Jesus, uh, the last Adam, has bought back everything that the first Adam lost. And he did what the first Adam failed to do. And so uh, there's no condemnation from that. There's no condemnation from any source because in Christ Jesus, uh, we are born of his spirit, we are washed in his blood, and we are with Christ in God. Uh, the word condemnation it means more than just the opposite of justification. You know, we, we've talked about justification already, how God sees us uh, as if we had never sinned. He sees us as just and righteous uh, through uh, the blood of Christ. But uh, condemnation is more than just the opposite. Uh, it, it indicates that, uh, uh, this idea here indicates that we're not going to suffer the penalty for our sin, uh, because the guilt and penalty has been removed from the cross, or at the cross. And so those who are in Christ Jesus, in the body of Christ, uh, we don't live under the constant threat of punishment. Uh, unbelievers uh, live under that constant threat of the wrath of God, the punishment of God, because uh, one day they will receive the punishment for their sins, whether it be tomorrow, uh, uh, receiving the consequences of their sin, or whether it be in eternity. But they constantly live under that threat of punishment from God. But as believers, we, we don't live under that threat. That, that's completely gone. There is no threat of punishment. Uh, because um, that was taken care of at the cross. So there's no sin that a believer can commit uh, which can be held against him. Since Christ paid the penalty and... Uh, his righteousness was imputed to the believer. And so uh, there's no sin that we commit uh, now or we have committed in the past that can be held against us as believers. Uh, there's no sin that can ever reverse God's decision. Uh, we are not able to commit a sin that will undo the work of Christ on the cross. And so uh, that's what, that, what Paul means here when he says there's no condemnation. When we are saved... We are saved from the wrath of God forever. It is an eternal salvation. Uh, no longer are we lost sinners living under the condemnation and, and, uh, and doomed to an eternity in hell. Uh, and we are now saved forever and ever. That means we can never lose our salvation. The verdict here is not less condemnation. Uh, Paul isn't saying that we have less condemnation now that we know Christ. Uh, that's, that's what many believers uh, seem to think that uh, our standing has improved in Jesus, and, and so it's not, uh, you know, not as bad as we used to be. Well, that's not accurate. Uh, our, our standing has been completely transformed uh, before Christ, uh, and our status has changed completely to a status of no condemnation, a status of being justified, and therefore no condemnation. So the Holy Spirit is a protective seal. Uh, he guarantees our salvation. Look at Ephesians 1. Verses 13 and 14, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. And somebody can read that for me, please. Paul comments on this idea of uh, the sealing of the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Mm -hmm. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who has given us a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. Okay, thank you. 
So we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's a, a, a seal, a mark, uh, of permanence. Um, you know, in, in um, Roman times and even in medieval times, <clears throat> communications from uh, the king or the emperor or whatever, or somebody important, would be sealed. Uh, they would have a, a scroll, uh, and they would write the message on the scroll, they'd roll it up, and then they would put a wax seal on there, and then put the stamp of the uh, emperor, whoever it was, in that seal. And uh, that, uh, that uh, testified to the importance of that message. It was a seal saying nobody else could touch this uh, except those who were you know, authorized. Well, the Holy Spirit is a seal for us, uh, even better than, than that type of a seal. Uh, the Holy Spirit is a permanent seal. Uh, he guarantees our salvation. Uh, he has put his stamp of approval, if you will, on our salvation, and uh, thus it can never be lost. And eternal security is a concept that uh, some people have a hard time accepting, uh, a concept that some people struggle with. But uh, the fact is there's nothing that can separate us from God once we have been brought into his family, once he has purchased us, he has sealed us uh, with the Holy Spirit, and now our, our salvation is secure for all of eternity. Because once the Holy Spirit regenerates our heart, it can never die again. Once we have been brought back to life, uh, spiritually speaking, we can never die again. Once our sins are forgiven and atoned for, then there's no amount of sin that can reverse that work that Jesus uh, completed upon the cross. Uh, because the work of salvation is done by God. We have no part in it. We have zero uh, effort uh, in the game, and, and uh, the work is completely a work of God when it comes to salvation. And through the sacrifice of, uh, and the uh, work of Christ, uh, we then have a permanent salvation. It is forever. It is eternal. And so when we come to Jesus by faith, we are delivered from the threat of divine retribution, uh, but we are also delivered from the specter of hell. Uh, there is no condemnation. So as a believer, we have no fear. Uh, we don't have to fear death. We don't have to fear anything happening in this life. Uh, because uh, if something happens, we know that we're going into an eternity with God in heaven. And uh, we need not fear ever losing that uh, eternal home. And so we have a great hope, uh, even in this life, that uh, there is no condemnation for anything that we do, uh, and, and our salvation cannot be lost. Uh, so there's that promise of no condemnation, but then there's also a place of refuge from condemnation. Uh, and again, the basis of this assurance is Jesus Christ. There is no condemnation. Uh, in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who makes the difference. You know, people can be in the church and die lost. People can be good neighbors and die lost. Uh, but when we are in Jesus, we are saved to the uttermost, and we are fully secured uh, and safe from an eternity in hell. Uh, a theologian by the name of uh, Poole, he says, this phrase imports that there is a mystical and spiritual union betwixt Christ and believers. This is sometimes expressed by Christ being in them, and here by their being in Christ. Christ is in believers by his spirit, and believers are in Christ by faith. And so, uh, Jesus is the basis of our assurance. And Jesus is the only refuge for the souls of men. He is the only safe harbor uh, where we can find salvation and forgiveness and hope and everlasting life. And so those who are in Christ are not condemned because Christ was condemned in their place. And there's no punishment for them because Christ was punished in their place and took their punishment upon himself. So therefore, to know Christ is to be a partaker of eternal life. Look at 1 John 5.12. 1 John 5.12, and if somebody can read that for me, please. Okay, uh, 1 John 5.12. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Okay, thank you. So he who has the Son of God has life, and that's not just life, that's eternal life uh, that John is talking about there. And so, uh, in, to know Christ uh, is to have that eternal life and to be a partaker of that eternal life. 
Uh, and so we, we've got that uh, refuge uh, from condemnation, but uh, notice that it doesn't say we will never sin. Uh, the, the, the verse here doesn't say that we're going to be sinlessly perfect uh, and, uh, you know, like Christ was. Christ was perfect, but as believers, uh, we still have that sin nature that we talked about last, uh, the last couple of weeks. Uh, we still uh, battle that sin nature. And so uh, Christians do fail and they do make mistakes. They do sin. Uh, it happens. Uh, that's very clear from chapter 7. We saw that Paul uh, described his disgust at the fact that he still fails and does the kinds of things that he no longer really wants to do. Uh, and so when believers sin, they will suffer the consequences of that sin. Uh, but it is not uh, eternal consequences. It will be just the temporal consequences of that sin. There's no condemnation uh, because that condemnation uh, was taken care of on the cross. And so we do suffer the consequences of our sin. Uh, but uh, we are not going to suffer eternally uh, for our sin because that was taken care of. Uh, Paul, uh, you know, he admitted that occasionally he does the very things that he no longer wants to do. But it's not a lifestyle of, of sin and rebellion uh, it's a matter of occasionally succumbing to the flesh, uh, which, of course, we ought not to do, but we, we do fail sometimes. Uh, but uh, the law, uh, you know, the law is going to condemn, but since believers have a new relationship to the law, they cannot be condemned uh, because that was already taken care of. Uh, we see that we are delivered from the sentence of sin. That's the first uh, uh, item of freedom that we're talking about here. But secondly, we see that the law cannot claim you. The law cannot claim you. In verse 2, Paul goes on to say, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. So what is this law of sin and death that he's talking about? Well, he described that in chapter 7, verses 7 through 25, the law of sin and death. Uh, it lies nearby, ready to challenge our every desire to do right. It wages a relentless warfare until it has made a captive out of the person who tries to fulfill God's law. Uh, it's called the law of sin and death because sin, as Paul frequently, uh, as Paul mentioned frequently, sin produces death. Uh, he said in Romans 5:21, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so the law of sin and death is the authority that sin has <coughs> and had over our whole nature. <coughs> but that ended with, uh, 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 it, it resulted in complete severance of fellowship with God. That's what the law of sin and death is. Uh, and the law sinners under the control of this law of sin and death and is subject to three masters. That is the flesh, the world, and the devil. Uh, so the unbeliever is subject to the flesh, to the world, and to the devil. Uh, under those three masters, and any person who has not trusted Jesus Christ is not in control of his own life. He is subject to the will and the whims of one of these three masters. Uh, he's being controlled by these three evil influences. Uh, and those lives are affected in different ways. Uh, some law sinners are led into lives of unspeakable wickedness and evil. And, you know, we hear stories about those people that are so evil, it's, it's beyond comprehension. Uh, and that's the result of, of some people uh, being under the influence of these three masters. Uh, but then there's others that are upstanding, good citizens. There may even be church members. Uh, they might be righteous and, and are not righteous, but religious, and they might appear righteous. But they are still lost and headed to the same hell because they are still under the law of sin and death. Uh, and it's a wretched existence uh, to be in, but it's an existence that's shared by billions of people around the world. But the opposite of that is the law of the spirit of life that Paul speaks of here. And the law of the spirit of life, it breaks the domination uh, of the old law of sin and death. <clears throat> under the law of the spirit of life, uh, since we are dead to the law, we are free from the law. Uh, and so the spirit of life, of course, is the Holy Spirit. And he brings new life uh, because he is life. He's the spirit of life. So he brings new life into us. 
when we are saved. And uh, through Jesus Christ, we are set free, and we are no longer subject to the law of sin and death. Now we are subject to the law of the spirit of life. Uh, and that is synonymous with the gospel. And so when Jesus comes into a life, he changes everything. Uh, now in him, uh, no longer uh, are we subject to those three masters. Uh, no longer are we uh, under the control of the flesh or the world or the devil. Uh, instead, we are uh, in Jesus Christ, and, and he changes everything in our life. By him and uh, in him, by the power of the Spirit, we have the ability to stand against those three enemies and uh, to take a stand and, and refuse uh, to uh, submit uh, to those masters. We are delivered from the bondage of sin and we are allowed to live a new life in Jesus Christ. And so that's what Paul uh, spoke of in Romans 6, uh, is uh, that we've been delivered from slavery to sin. And in Jesus, we've been given all the tools that we need to live a holy life for his glory. And so the secret lies in using the tools that he's given us and learning to say no to sin and yes to the spirit. And, uh, and that's uh, something that we've talked about already uh, when we're talking about uh, chapter 7. And so uh, we are free from judgment. And the law, uh, not only are we delivered from the sins of sin, uh, the law cannot claim us. But thirdly, the law cannot condemn you. Uh, not only the law cannot claim you, but the law cannot condemn you. In verse 3, Paul says, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So the law is weak, Paul says. There was a weakness in the law. Uh, the law could never get people to fulfill its sacred requirements. But grace has succeeded where the law failed. And that's what Paul is talking about here. The law could not give freedom from condemnation. Uh, it could not justify, it could not impart life, uh, and it could not produce holy living because it was weak through the flesh. Uh, the law is weak in its uh, inability to accomplish uh, uh, all of this work. And so that's something that only God can do, God alone. Uh, can do, and he has done. Uh, the law cannot make men righteous. It can only point out how sinful men really are. And, uh, you know, Paul mentioned in chapter 3, verse 20, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And so we've seen that weakness already. The law can convict men of sin. Uh, it can define sin, but it cannot emancipate men from sin. Only the grace of God is able to emancipate us. And so uh, the whole world is sinful and is in desperately in need of the righteousness of God. And the Bible makes it clear that every person who does not trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is sick. In fact, they are terminally ill with sin. When a person is sick, uh, they will often try any remedy uh, that they think will work to make themselves better. And, and you hear all kinds of desperate people trying uh, all sorts of crazy treatments. Uh, and so for those who are afflicted with spiritual illness, uh, you know, people try all sorts of religious things. They try all sorts of different religions. Uh, you know, they want to keep the, the, the rules of all these different religions, hoping to find some way of eternal life. Uh, when in fact, uh, there's only one remedy, uh, there's only one cure, and that is Jesus Christ. And so if the righteousness is to come to an individual, it must come through the agency of grace and not through human works. So where the law failed, Christ prevailed. God sent his son uh, to save us and to do what the law could not do. Uh, again, the law can only point out our sin. It cannot regenerate us or save us from our sin. And so Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Uh, he came as a man, uh, and he bore our sins in his body on the cross. And so by coming to the world in human form, he resembled sinful humanity, although he was sinless, uh, and he gave himself as a sacrifice for sin, uh, and therefore Christ condemned sin in the flesh. And so God's condemnation against sin was fully poured out 
upon the sinless flesh of Jesus Christ on the cross. And when he did this, it provided the cure for the sickness of sin. Uh, and so uh, Christ prevailed. Now, all of those who trust in him by faith uh, are forever delivered from their spiritual sickness and are made whole. Uh, God sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Uh, that is a payment for our sins. He came in the flesh. He was the word incarnate. And he bore our sins uh, so that the law could then be completely fulfilled. And so where the law required blood for forgiveness, Jesus provided blood so that those who are clothed in him uh, are clothed in his righteousness, uh, sharing his suffering, so that as he died, uh, so we died to the law and to sin so that we can be forgiven. Uh, you know, you're familiar with the law of double jeopardy, right? Uh, if a person has been tried uh, for a crime, a, a murder uh, especially, uh, and they're not guilty, they're found not guilty, they can never be tried again for that same crime. Uh, and so that's the way it is, spiritually speaking, uh, is uh, we've been tried, as it were, on the cross uh, through Christ, uh, and uh, that's been taken care of, and so we can never be tried again uh, for those sins. They cannot be brought against us because they were taken care of already. And so uh, we have uh, uh, these uh, benefits from, uh, from this work of salvation. We are delivered from the sentence of sin. Uh, the law cannot claim us. The law cannot condemn us. And then finally, the law cannot control us. Uh, the law cannot control you in verse 4. So that is the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And so he continues his thought here from verse 3. Uh, when we are in Jesus, the whole righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us. And so because Jesus fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law, and because we are in Christ, we too have fulfilled the law through Jesus Christ. And so the law is fulfilled in regards to obedience, because Jesus' righteousness stands uh, in, in place of ours. The law is fulfilled in us in regard to punishment because any punishment that was demanded by the law was already poured out upon Jesus Christ. And so the righteous requirements of the law are fulfilled in us. It's not fulfilled by us. It's fulfilled in us through Jesus Christ. Uh, and according to the word of God, when a lost sinner trusts Jesus Christ as their Savior, then that lost sinner is made right with God. He is justified, uh, and uh, he is completely changed, and uh, God views him now through the blood of Jesus Christ and sees him as one who is justified, one who is saved and righteous, uh, because that was taken care of already. And so they are, are uh, someone who places their faith and trust in Christ then is declared righteous by God himself. Uh, it is as if they never sinned, and they would never sin again. They are fully justified. Uh, Jesus is our substitute. Uh, simply put, he was our substitute. So he was treated as a sinner so that we can be treated as righteous. And so believers live a righteous life in the power of the Holy Spirit and not in the power of the law. Uh, we live that righteous life in the power of the Holy Spirit and not in the power of the law. The law does not have the power to produce holiness. It can only reveal and condemn sin. Uh, the justification or reconciliation with God brings a new power to keep the law, uh, which makes the recipient of it less aware uh, of the demands of the law uh, uh, as well. And so this new power we have comes from the Holy Spirit. Uh, he dwells within us, and he enables us to work in obedience to God's will. And uh, so the Holy Spirit in our lives produces a life of obedience, which uh, the law commanded, but it could not produce. So the Holy Spirit uh, furnishes us that power. Uh, he gives us the power uh, in, to live a righteous life. He, he enables us to live a righteous life. Uh, but again, we have the decision uh, to make of, of submitting to him uh, or allowing our flesh uh, to uh, uh, guide and direct us. Uh, and again, that's what we discussed already uh, last week. But 
Uh, the new life is marked by obedience to the Holy Spirit and not by obedience to the flesh. So when we allow the flesh to reign over the spirit, we find ourselves bound uh, by those sinful patterns uh, that Paul spoke of there in, in uh, chapter 7. And, uh, you know, that, that was the struggle that he spoke of there in chapter 7. But walking in the spirit means that the course and the direction and the progress of our life is directed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so that's the sum total of the activity of the life of a believer. Uh, it's a continued and progressive motion. We continue to walk forward. We continue to move forward and make that progress. Uh, sometimes we may stumble and fall, but uh, we get up and we just keep on moving forward and have that progress. <clears throat> Is that still recording? Yes. Okay. What, what does the... How does the notion of grieving the Holy Spirit fit into this? So that would be when we uh, allow our flesh uh, to uh, direct us or take control, uh, then it's going to grieve the Holy Spirit because uh, we are not allowing Him to be in control. Instead, we're returning to that old uh, sinful behavior uh, that we ought not to be. Uh, it's just like when your children disobey. You know, it, it grieves you to see your children disobey or it grieves you to see your children make wrong decisions, right? Uh, and so that's the that same idea. Uh, it's that it, it grieves the Holy Spirit for us to uh, ignore Him and follow our, uh, our old nature. Uh, again, it's not, you know, we don't have, um, we have no condemnation for that and, and uh, you know, we, we have that ongoing struggle between the, the old and new man. Uh, and uh, so whenever we fail, then of course that's going to grieve the Holy Spirit. But Yeah, the, the idea of grieving the Holy Spirit seems seems to imply that the Holy Spirit departs from you. Is, is, I mean, is that just a temporary thing or what? Um, in, in the Old Testament, uh, we did see instances where the Holy Spirit would depart from people. Okay? Yeah. King Saul is an example, and there's others. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, in, in the New Testament, what we see, and in um, salvation and, and the way of grace it is, the Holy Spirit permanently dwells us. He never leaves us. Uh, we, we read it in, in John uh, uh, 14. Uh, Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would come and, and dwell within us and that He was going to be with us forever. And so the Holy Spirit's not going to depart from us. When we get saved, we receive all of the Holy Spirit we're ever going to receive. He becomes a part of our life and uh, He never leaves. Now there, there can be times where we can ignore Him and where we can grieve Him, where we can, um, you know, push Him away, so to speak. Uh, but... Uh, he doesn't leave us. Even when we are in sin, the Holy Spirit is still dwelling within us. Uh, and he's doing that work to try to convict us of that sin. Uh, and, and point out uh, the wrong that we're doing. And uh, he does that through our conscience. Um, and, you know, sometimes people can ignore the Holy Spirit so much that uh, Paul speaks of a, 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 the heart being seared. That a conscience being seared. Uh, and uh, that, that's where they get to a point that, that they don't listen to him anymore. Uh, but if someone were to get to that point, I think God would, would end up taking them home. Depending on what they're involved in, uh, it's likely that God would end up taking them to heaven rather than allowing them to continue to defame the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, you know. yeah. <clears throat> Alright, so we see that uh, believers live a righteous life in the power of the Holy Spirit and not in the power of the law. So uh, that brings us to the last thought here uh, in regards to the legalist. And we've, we've talked about this a little bit, and of course Paul focuses on this in Galatians. Uh, but the legalist tries to obey God in his own strength, and he fails to measure up to the righteousness that God demands. Uh, and so a legalist is someone who tries to fulfill the law and tries to earn his own salvation, but even after um, someone is saved, they can become legalistic 
and I've known pastors and, and churches like this, uh, where, where they try to define someone's spirituality by whether they're following this particular set of external rules. Uh, but we don't fulfill the law by walking in the spirit instead of the flesh. Uh, God fulfills the law in us when we walk after the spirit of God. So we're not the ones who, in our own strength, are able to fulfill the law anyway. Uh, salvation, again, is completely of God. God is the one who has fulfilled the law. And a spirit-led believer experiences the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit as he yields his life to the Lord. Uh, and so, uh, again, even after salvation, uh, you know, we're not obligated to follow a list of do's and don'ts in order to be counted as spiritual in someone's eyes. Yes, there's things that we should do. Yes, we should do right. And yes, we should be different. But uh, it's not for the purpose of trying to be better than someone or trying to be a, a spiritual giant or whatever. Uh, there's a difference in the motives. Does that make sense? Um, and so uh, a spirit-led believer uh, will yield his life to the Lord. And uh, as Paul says in Philippians 2, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Uh, so as we submit to the Lord, he's going to direct us in doing the right things. And uh, he's going to direct us in doing and making the right choices. Uh, but it's not for our own glory. It's for the glory of God. And that's really the difference in the legalist's mindset is they're doing it for their own glory. But the legalist likes to brag about how good they are, uh, how they can fulfill the law and, and, and complete the, uh, their own uh, righteousness. Uh, but uh, as Paul says in Philippians, it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So uh, as believers, uh, yes, we ought to do the right things. Yes, we ought to, to uh, behave appropriately. We have to say the right things. We have to be clean in our conduct and lives. But it's not uh, to get the righteousness of God. It's uh, because we are already righteous. We ought to do the right things. So the believer doesn't have to depend upon his success in keeping the law for his acceptance with God. Uh, and in fact, our justification is offered on the basis of Jesus Christ, as we've already seen. So this morning we've seen our freedom from judgment. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We're delivered from the sentence of sin. Uh, we no longer have to be concerned uh, with uh, the wrath of God hanging over us. We no longer have to worry about standing before God in judgment because we have the place of refuge in Jesus Christ. Uh, secondly, we've seen that the law cannot claim you. Uh, we are no longer under the law of sin and death, but instead we are under the law of the spirit of life. And uh, so our life is <clears throat> holy and righteous uh, through the work of the spirit. Thirdly, we've seen that the law cannot condemn you. Uh, that is, the law is weak when it comes to salvation. It's unable to save us. All it can do is uh, show us our sin. Uh, and it, it cannot emancipate us. But where the law failed, Jesus Christ prevailed. He is the one that has been able to make us righteous. And he has done that. And then finally, we've seen that the law cannot control you. Uh, we've been made right with God. We live a righteous life in the power of the Holy Spirit, not in the power of the law. And so that is the life of deliverance in the Spirit of God. It's a new life, it's a better life, and it's a glorious life. It's a life that is like no other, and it belongs to every person who will trust Jesus Christ for salvation. So there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that is the wonderful truth that we see in uh, these verses here in Romans chapter 8, and we will continue uh, to look at that in the next few weeks.